Um, good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, my name is Beth Milligan. I'm one of the co-founders of Etc. I'll be moderating tonight's event. Um, we just wanted to give a couple reminders up front. Um, we've been going for about a year now. We've covered a lot of interesting topics, um, some controversial topics, and certainly tonight is a topic that a lot of people are talking about. Um, so I do want to just give a couple of reminders to kind of frame the conversation tonight. Um, one reminder is that we're not a debate format, we're a discussion format. Um, so the goal of tonight is not to have a winning argument or to come to any kind of conclusion, but rather just present information on this topic that might help you think about it in a new way. Um, there are multiple ways to view this topic, and we're going to try our best to do so with empathy and respect, and we kind of ask our audience to, to do the same as well. Um, one thing specific to tonight's topic that I want to touch on is that we're not going to be discussing the morality of homosexuality, homosexuality tonight. Our goal is not to decide if it's immoral or immoral. Um, Scott's going to talk about some of the legal issues that are going on with same-sex marriage right now. And Anthony's going to talk about some of the ways different religious groups are approaching the issue. But we're not going to be debating the morality of, of homosexuality. Um, the other thing we want to say is that we know <clears throat> this is potentially a sensitive topic for some people. There may be audience members who are either gay or have gay friends or family members. So again, we really hope to just help you think about the topic in a new way and, and do so in a respectful way. Um, when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll just ask you guys to keep that in mind as well. Just try to keep an open mind and an open heart tonight. Um, I want to talk about who our presenters are. Um, to my immediate right is Scott Gordon. Uh, Scott is an attorney here in Traverse City. He has a bachelor's degree from Cornerstone University and a law degree from Michigan State University College of Law. He's worked for appeals courts at both the state and federal level, as well as private law firms in East Lansing and Traverse City. He is a currently associated with the law firm at Putney Zayas in Traverse City, and he is a previous presenter at Etc. Um, and his background and experience includes a lot of work with First Amendment law as well as Supreme Court precedent. Um, to his right is Anthony Weber. Anthony is one of the fellow co-founders of Etc. He's an adjunct teacher for Spring Arbor University. He's an author, blogger, pastor, and comparative worldviews teacher at Traverse City Christian School. He is also a previous panelist at Etc. And he has a, a bachelor's degree in English education and a master's degree in theology. Um, and to get started tonight, I'm going to ask Scott to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about the legal issues dealing with gay, gay marriage. Sure. Um, the way I kind of want to frame this discussion, or at least my portion of it, is kind of in a few different snapshots of what's going on. Um, it might seem jumbled or might seem like I'm jumping around because everything is kind of tangled together and sort of to unravel it, we have to understand a few different pieces of the puzzle. Um, first, I kind of want to talk about what's been happening at the state level, specifically using Vermont as a case study. That was the first state that really did any, anything meaningful on the same-sex marriage issue. So I want to describe what happened there and kind of the political fallout from that and kind of how things have played out since then. Um, then I want to talk about a little bit what's happened already at the federal level, specifically in the United States Supreme Court, um, and kind of what can, we can ex possibly expect to see. Then I want to move on and talk about two specific Supreme Court doctrines, the Equal Protection Amendment and the Standing Doctrine. And those issues both, those are both issues that are going to come into play with the Proposition 8 um, cases that are being cited before the Supreme Court now, um, and opinions on those cases are expected to come out later this summer. Um, so I'll start with Vermont. In 1999, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court handed down a case called Baker versus State of Vermont, and it struck down the state's then existing marriage statute on grounds that in denying gay couples the common benefits and protections under Vermont law, excluding those couples from matters such as health insurance benefits and inheritance rights violated the state's constitution. The state's constitution at the time was written as follows, I'll quote it. That government is, or ought to be, instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community, and not for the particular in emolument or advantage of any single person, family, or set of persons who are a part only of that community. So basically, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court said within that language about protecting all people equally, there could be no place for differentiation between straight and gay couples for the purposes of marriage. As the Supreme Court said that, the Vermont Supreme Court, they didn't also want to be the one to strike down the law and decide how that would play out. So they punted to the legislature and decided the legislature would be the best place for this to take place. They offered a few reasons for that. Number one, they said, as far as separation of powers, 
Um, really, the Supreme Court isn't the one who should be deciding how things play out, deciding the practicalities of those sorts of things. It was more a legislative issue. The court also recognized that without legislative guidelines in place regarding the rights or status of gay couples, more explicit judicial action taken by the court could lead to a lot of uncertainty and confusion. And last, the court acknowledged that this would be something that would be, it used the phrase, political cauldron, the public debate that would ensue. So basically the court said, it's not our job to do this, we're not really equipped to do this, we don't know how to do it, and even if we could, we don't want to do this just sort of punting the issue to the legislature. Now, within that, though, it still sparked the political controversy that they were hoping to avoid. Um, the governor's office received about 13,000 phone calls in the months after the Supreme Court decision. Keep in mind, the governor does not sit on the Supreme Court. He's just a governor. But <laughs> of the state's 600,000 people population, he received 13,000 phone calls. Um, polling at the time found that 38% of Vermont citizens agreed with the court, 52% disagreed. Opponents saw the decision as an outgrowth of judicial activism, which is kind of ironic because the court was, in fact, trying to say, we're not trying to get involved here. So in a possible attempt to accommodate split public opinion, the legislature tried to craft the civil union compromise. Um, there were legal, re legal rights and responsibility associated with marriage, but without the term marriage. That happened in 2000. Um, ultimately, though, they weren't able to avoid all the controversies that th surrounded everything, and Vermont finally recognized same-sex marriage on September 1st of 2009, after the legislature overrode a governor's veto of a marriage bill that was introduced in the state house. Basically, the legislature introduced a new bill that would define marriage as a man and a woman and write that into the Constitution. Um, that passed, and then the governor overrode it, and that was the first time in decades that the governor had done so within the state. So you have this thing where, in 1999, the Supreme Court was forced to take up this case. They didn't want to do it because of all the controversy, and so they tried to do it as non-controversial as possible. Nevertheless, it sparked more and more controversy, and there was this 10-year battle back and forth, ultimately the governor overriding a decision of the legislature, and then the legislature <laughs> upholding the law. So that's where we find ourselves. That's just one example of cases. Um, and in fact, a lot of different states kind of enacted legislation or constitutional amendments in the wake of the Baker versus State case being handed down. Two specific constitutional amendments were written, and a dozen or so states visited the issue on their own ballots in the next election. So you kind of have this thing where Vermont kind of put the issue on the map and brought it to the collective consciousness for a lot of states. Um, and if that happened at some level within the states, that happened even more on the level when the Supreme Court first took up a similar issue in 2003. The case was called Lawrence versus Texas. And basically, the Supreme Court there examined a Texas statute that criminalized consensual sexual intimacy when such conduct was between adults of the same sex. Basically, the court struck down that statute. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion, and he wrote, I'll quote a portion of it, liberty protects the person from unwa unwarranted government intrusions into a dwelling or other private place, and presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, belief, expression, and certain intimate conduct. So based on the right to liberty granted by the Constitution's due process clause, the Supreme Court declared that gays and lesbians were entitled to respect for their private lives and that Texas could not, quote, demean their existence or, quote, control their destiny by criminalizing their private consensual conduct. A famous quote from that case you often hear, at least in certain circles, is that these matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy, are central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of meaning, of existence, of the universe and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood where they formed under compulsion of the state. So there's kind of this arena where the state will not interfere, these things that are so central to existence and so central to identity. And that's kind of what the court identified. Um, this was not a same sex marriage case. This was about the way you express yourself intimately in your own home in among consenting adults. 
Now, the court avoided discussing the merits of legalizing same-sex marriage in spite of other governmental efforts towards dealing with the issue that were taking place at state and local levels. And the strong implications for that subject that the Lawrence majority opinion at least arguably held. If you're talking about these things that are so important to fundamentals of human existence, marriage seems like it would be tied up within that. Justice O'Connor did bro broach the subject in her opinion. She agreed with the court but wrote an opinion that went a little bit further. She examined the equal protection argument raised by the plaintiffs, and her opinion was premised on the principle that a legislative desire to harm a politically unpopular group cannot form a legis legitimate governmental interest. Basically saying, if you're writing laws with the sole purpose of discriminating against gay people, there's no rational basis for that sort of law. Within that framework, that a statute treats the same conduct differently based solely on the participants would be enough for Justice O'Connor to find the anti-gay animus necessary to strike down the sodomy statute based on her understanding of equal protection. Nevertheless, in addressing her opinion's implications for gay marriage, Justice O'Connor insisted that beyond mere moral disapproval of gays, reasons including preserving the traditional institution of marriage would still support statutory distinctions on the basis of sexual identity. In a dissenting opinion, <coughs> Justice Scalia claimed that O'Connor's acknowledgement of preserving the traditional institution of marriage was a mere euphemism for moral disapproval, and that in any instance, distinguishing between laws seeking to preserve traditional sexual mores and those expressing moral disapproval would prove unworkable. Basically, Scalia, in disagreeing with the court's opinion, kind of foreshadows that the debate is ultimately going to become one about same-sex marriage. He writes, if moral disappropriation of homosexual conduct is no legitimate state interest for purposes of prescribing that conduct, and if, as the court coos, casting aside all pretense of neutrality, when sexual, sexuality finds overt expression in intimate conduct with another person, the conduct can be but one element in a personal bond that is more enduring, what justification could there possibly be for denying the benefits of marriage to homosexual couples exercising the liberty protected by the Constitution. So he kind of says that, not that he would be supporting same-sex marriage, but kind of in a s scary sort of way, as this, this could be this um, great specter of same-sex marriage that we want to avoid. So surely the court must be wrong to be striking down a sodomy statute in the first place. Interestingly, Justice Scalia's opinion is the one that really endured um, the fact that he brought up same-sex marriage at a time when the majority of the opinion the court's majority wasn't talking about it, really carried the day. Um, the day after Lawrence was decided, despite it not being a same-sex marriage case, over 50 stories about gay marriage ran in major U.S. newspapers. Um, the press's treatment continued beyond that. There were over 1,500 newspaper stories about same-sex marriage appearing in the month of August 2003, which was one month after the decision was decided. It put the decision on the map nationally. Um, in the three months before it came out, there was usually between 50 and 100 articles that appeared in national newspapers in a given month about same-sex marriage. Um, there were 1,500 in that month, and then it kind of continued flowing along, and now it, the number kind of hovers around 500 per month. So Lawrence really put the issue on the map. It fell slightly, but it's been part of the collective consciousness since then, and perhaps inadvertently. Throughout that period of intense public debate, the effect of having it come to the fore really polarized um, public opinion. Before Lawrence was decided, um, there was a high of about 40% people that were in favor of same-sex marriage. That number dropped to around 25% in the three or four months after uh, Lawrence was decided, and the number opposed rose from 55 to around 65. So Lawrence is evidence, I think, in at least some way that when the Supreme Court takes on an issue that perhaps the public isn't ready to have happen, um, there's a certain aspect in society where we don't like to see that taken away from us and having a court make a decision where the people haven't really thought it through. Um, which I think is an interesting thing to think about as we go on and talk about what's happening currently. Um, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about two Supreme Court doctrines that are um, pretty essential to the whole debate. As I said, uh, the court in Lawrence kind of avoided talking about equal protection. Um, equal protection, though, I think it was the major focus of um, the oral argument 
before the Supreme Court in the uh, Defense of Marriage Act cases and the Proposition 8 cases, and it seems like if the decision is made on the merits, it's going to come down to an equal protection issue. The Equal Protection Amendment says that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So equal protection, um, the hallmarks of it are where you have a law, a statute, or a policy that separates people into groups and then treats them differently. Um, really the foreground for that Equal Protection Amendment is um, civil rights issues, specifically race. Um, Brown versus Board of Education would be a primary example. Um, equal protection favors allowing people to, students to go to the same public school. Um, equal protection has also been applied to gender. Um, as it's been applied to gender and, you know, as you get a little bit further from the issue of race where it was kind of began, courts have to really decide how the issue of equal protection applies. When which kind of groups and what kind of classifications deserve this protection and what kinds don't. Um, basically there's a five part test that courts use to go through. I don't think we'll see when the Proposition 8 opinion gets handed down, you know, just five bullet points of a court going through this, but by and large of all the opinions about these cases over the years, they seem to go back to these five major categories. Um, first is the group being discriminated against a discrete and insular minority. With race, you very much had that. It's easy to tell race and ethnicity, who is who. Um, you have you know, various neighborhoods and major cities that different pockets of people live in. Um, so, and you know, we're talking specifically about minorities, so in race, that certainly makes sense. Um, the second prong of this test would be, is there a history of discrimination? With race and ethnicity, you would certainly have that history of discrimination that you're trying to overcome through laws. And if there's laws that separate people, it's further perpetuating that kind of discrimination. Um, the third would be, is there a lack of political power? Um, that's talking kind of both in terms of do they have the right to vote and do they have representation um, in the political process. So with race and ethnicity, there's not really a strong history of um, minorities being rep well represented um, and voting rights also came later. The fourth is it an immutable characteristic unrelated to merit or ability. Um, race and ethnicity certainly would be an immutable characteristic and certainly unrelated to merit and ability. And then finally, is there kind of an us versus them mentality in the way that the specific statute being discussed um, is written? So um, as going forward, that was also applied to gender. Um, and with gender, you know, you're talking about a minority, but they're not as discreet and insular, or they're not as insular, certainly. Um, a history of discrimination, not quite as strong as with race and ethnicity. Lack of political power, perhaps the case. Um, it is an immutable characteristic, unrelated to merit or ability, and an us versus them mentality, you don't really see it quite as much. So basically, any kind of classification related to race or ethnicity, you're going to see a court treat it with the most strict of scrutiny. With uh, gender, it's going to be a little bit less so. And as equal protection has been applied to other things, such as uh, you know, physically handicapped or um, illegitimacy and things like that, there's a little bit less. So really, I think where we're going to see this case decided is on the um, five issues kind of pertaining to equal protection. Um, you know, and I guess we could kind of go through those, the five, with, sec with regard to sexual orientation. Do we have a discrete and insular minority? Um, a minority, certainly. Um, they would be discrete. Uh, and then insular, I guess, you know, in larger cities you do have areas where um, gay people are known to live more or less. So it's, it kind of passes under that. Is there a history of discrimination? Um, yeah, and it, it, it's currently there as well. Um, a lack of political power. Representation may be there, but um, it's not really necessarily a representation related specifically to people who are advancing gay causes um, in office. Um, and, and as far as voting rights, gay people have always had it. Is it an immutable characteristic unrelated to ability or merit? Yeah, certainly. And then um, is there an us versus them mentality? Not really. So it kind of, 
I don't know, as far as balancing gay rights against those of, of other civil rights with gender and race, I think you kind of come out somewhere in the middle. And it'll be interesting to see what the court says going forward. Um, just wanted to talk ever so briefly about the standing doctrine as well. This is something that wasn't initially part of the arguments that happened in the Proposition 8 case at the trial level or at the first appeals level. When the Supreme Court decided to take the case, they went back to the parties and said, hey, we want you to brief and be ready to argue about standing. And standing, so it's something that they thought would be an issue that was kind of a glaring thing that wasn't seen before. Um, standing basically says, in Article 3 of the Constitution, uh, the Supreme Court only handles actual cases and controversies. Born out of that, you need two parties, on e one party on each side that has a vested interest in the case. So if you have a plaintiff, the plaintiff has to be uniquely harmed by whatever the lawsuit regards, and then the defendant has to have um, an interest in defending that lawsuit. Basically, it's ensuring you know, no collusion between parties and also that the Supreme Court's time is well spent on these cases. Um, this is interesting here because normally Proposition 8, because it's a California law, would be defended in court by the state of California, by um, you know, their governor, his solicitor general. The governor didn't want to take up the case and didn't want to defend it because it went, flew in the face of former California law. So instead, um, representatives of the website protectmarriage.org were actually the ones defending the, or prosecuting this lawsuit in court. Um, so there's kind of a question there of whether this people from this website really have, uh, you know, standing, whether they were particularly harmed by um, the fact that gay marriage may or may not be legal. Um, interestingly, just a few things from the oral arguments. One of the justices asked the lawyer for protectmarriage.org, has the Supreme Court ever allowed proponents of ballot initiatives to defend those initiatives in court? And the answer was no. Um, so the case could be, if it weren't decided on the merits, it could be dismissed on standing ground, saying these people were not harmed and cannot show any particularized harm based on the existence of same-sex marriage. And therefore, this lawsuit really has no place in the court, which kind of goes to the merits of the lawsuit as well, um, as far as you know whether straight people or people who are against gay marriage will be harmed by the fact that gay marriages occur. Um, a few other points just from the uh, oral arguments concerning Proposition 8. Basically, the protectmarriage.org uh, side's main interest, as stated, was in responsible procreation, saying that that justifies limiting marriage to opposite sex couples. Um, one justice said that Allowing same-sex couples to marry would not be any different from allowing opposite-sex couples who cannot have children to marry. Um, Justice Ginsburg noted that opposite-sex couples in prison are allowed to marry constitutionally, even though there is no possibility of procreation. Um, you know, there's, of course, no test to see whether you have the ability to have a child before you get married. Um, like a lot of things in the Supreme Court today, that it may come down to what Justice Kennedy thinks. He expressed at oral argument some concern about the 40,000 children living with their same-sex parents in California, emphasizing that they want their parents to be recognized as married. And he asked the plaintiffs whether the voices of those children are actually important. On the other end, he noted that sociological information about the effect of same-sex marriage on children was still relatively new. And he complained that the lower court's decision effectively penalized California. It had been fairly generous in providing rights to same-sex couples through domestic partnerships, but didn't go far enough in allowing them to marry. He also did seem to express some concern. Um, he was asking the court to enter uncharted waters in a case with a very narrow decision. It seems like this is going to be a 5-4 decision one way or another, um, and a real question about the weather case should proceed at all. So. Um, Justice Sotomayor asked why, if the proponents are urging the court to allow the states to experiment with same-sex marriage, the solution would be for the court to decide the Proposition 8 case now. After all, the court allowed the issue of racial segregation to play out in the country for decades after finally stepping in. So what, what will the most likely result be of these lawsuits that are ongoing? Um, 
It's possibly they could dismiss the case as saying that the fact that they even heard of the case in the first place was improvidentially granted. Um, they can kind of punt on the issue, kind of like what the state of Vermont did back in 1999. Um, they could uphold the law, which would really only affect um, the state of California. Striking down the law, as on the other hand, would affect California and any other states that have done anything against same-sex marriage. Um, but as we've seen just with Lawrence versus Texas and in the Vermont cases of old, um, anything of sweeping consequence that the Supreme Court do could have do a lot as far as galvanizing public opinion and really polarizing views about the subject. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, my personal opinion is that the Kate, the Proposition 8 will probably be struck down on equal protection grounds. Um, it seems like that's where things are headed. Um, and we'll see what the ramifications are for that. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you, so a follow-up question or two, and Anthony, if you have one, feel free to jump in. Um, you talked about the, you mentioned the, um, how the courts had intervened with segregated marriage, um, or interracial marriage, I should say. Um, at what point should, in your legal opinion, at what point should courts intervene in an issue that is still being played out in the public opinion sphere? So you had mentioned that sometimes when a court, the Supreme Court takes up an issue that the country is still grappling with and trying to come to a consensus on, that it can actually have the opposite effect of what advocates would want, which is support for gay marriage, but people feel like the decision has been made for them by the courts and that can tend to polarize people. Can you talk a little bit more about that and where you think maybe the counter argument would be people would say, well, if there's an issue of right or wrong, then the court should intervene no matter what to protect the rights of people involved, even if it's an unpopular opinion. So what do you kind of think about that process? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, there, there's a school of thought that says that courts deciding these kind of issues should play kind of, uh, I think the term is counter-majoritarian role, that they should be looking towards the rights of the minorities more than they would more than would be seen, obviously, in the voting booth because you're talking about a minority and more than would otherwise be um, granted. I think you do see that in these opinions, but uh, as far as the way things have actually played out historically, it, it seems like, I don't want to say that Supreme Court opinions are anachronistic, but I mean, they struck down Loving versus Virginia, which was the interracial marriage case at a time when very few states had laws still on the books about interracial marriage. The, same-sex sodomy case was struck down. I think that was a law that was on the books, one of those laws, oh, can you believe this is still illegal in Texas? I mean, it wasn't you know, being like routinely prosecuted um, by the state of Texas. So- What about something like Roe v. Wade? Yeah, um, I mean, that might be a closer example, but I, I, I still feel like a lot of these things, a lot of these things, things occur when um, public opinion has almost already spoken, or at least the majority seems to be there, or the trajectory is there. So if the Supreme Court were to make a decision um, in either DOMA or Prop 8 that has sweeping implications for legal precedents in other states, how do you think public opinion might react? People might traditionally think that that might open the way for more supportive gay marriage, but you're saying it could have a polarizing effect. Well, what we've seen at the state level, um, Vermont and Massachusetts would be the best examples. Um, the general trajectory has been upward in support of same-sex marriage. It's almost been, it's increased faster, I don't want to say exponentially faster, but it's increased faster in the states where same-sex marriage has been legalized. Mm -hmm. If it's gone up, let's say, from 40% to 50% in Michigan in the last 10 years, it's gone up from 40% to 55% in Vermont, for example. Somehow it's increasing faster and it seems like because, you know, the Virgins is in, we're letting these states kind of let things play out um, and seeing that there hasn't been a whole lot of disastrous consequences has kind of brought better opinions. Um, but at its inception, I think though, there's still a lot of controversy, which a, fed a sweeping federal decision would have a lot more consequences in that regard. It would be that political cauldron. Do you have a question, Anthony? Yeah, you were mentioning from Lawrence versus Texas that at one point in the, dis in the ruling, they used the language of the importance of 
being able to define one's own concept of, and you gave quite a list of things. I think there was meaning and life and personhood. And was the idea in there of defining one's own concept of marriage or relationships, or was that kind of what was covered in that language? Yeah, and in fact, the word marriage was specifically used, but the court never talked about whether, or at least the majority opinion didn't talk about whether this, what they were saying had implications for gay marriage. Um, but yeah, just there's that realm of things that are so closely tied to identity that the state shouldn't be able to interfere with them. I've heard a lot of discussion coming out of that ruling, kind of a slippery slope scenario. Um, does that does that type of language, do you feel like that legally opens the door for people to create whatever definition they would like? Or are there some structures in place that keep it uh, within a certain parameters? In, in other words, is the slippery slope discussion that goes on, is it a valid or an invalid one? Um, I can understand. I'm sympathetic to that argument, especially with such sweeping language. Um, you know, I guess, and it, I guess it's how we define personhood is almost limitless in that regard. Um, I guess I would say a slippery slope is only basically says we only want to avoid doing something good today if it means we're going to do something bad in the future. And I feel like there are, you know, um, measures in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. I mean, you still need at a certain point a state declaring something legal or some kind of ballot measure that declares it legal, um, it, it's not going to necessarily invite like a host of evils that haven't been thought of before now. There have been some people who have suggested a, slip, a, a slippery slope argument would be that if we um, redefine the traditional defini definition of marriage to include gay marriage, a slippery slope could be, well, then we could potentially see um, other kinds of non-traditional marriage, like if people have talked about interspecies marriage at the far extreme, or marriage between uh, arranged marriages, or or marriages between adults and children, things that we have laws for. But there is a sort of an argument people have said, well, this could lead to that. Do you think that has any legal legs? Um, well, Anthony might be getting into this as well, but I, I think when we're talking about marriage, which Maybe I should have defined it better at the outset. We're talking about that very specific, the very specific set of things, rights and responsibilities and benefits that go, that are attendant to a state declaring two people married. Um, visitations rights at the hospital, certain parts of evidence law, like you don't have to testify against your spouse, um, inheritance things, adoption rules, um, all of those sorts of things. And I think it's mostly changing what it means for two people to be spouses and allowing this more people into the fold rather than completely obliterating all definitions of marriage. Um, you know, just so many things like tax law don't really make sense with interspecies marriage or <laughs> with like a person and an inanimate object. It's, it's, a, it's still a pretty specific thing that um, the proponents of same-sex marriage are asking for. And it's asking to be like involved in what's existing. Thanks. Can, can I ask a final question? Of yeah, Scott? go ahead. Do you think civil union compromises will inevitably lead to same-sex marriage legislation? I think you mentioned in Vermont there was the initial... Yeah. Um, I do. I mean, it just, it just seems like that's kind of a legislative compromise that nobody is particularly happy at, about, at least in those states where it's played out for, for some period of time. Um, and so we're going to have, I'm going to ask a few more questions at the end and you guys will be able to ask questions to Scott, but I'm going to let Anthony talk maybe a little bit about the religious angle of it. Hey Beth, can I, could Scott, while well, he's moving over, could, could you repeat the five criteria you mentioned for reproduction? Yeah, um, a discrete and insular minority, um, if there's a history of discrimination, a lack of political power, um, an immutable characteristic unrelated to merit or ability, and an us versus them mentality. Okay. Do those all need to be met, or are they just things? No, it's kind of a balancing type of consideration. 
All right, we ready? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the way in which the religious community addresses the question of same-sex marriage. And the first thing I want to look at, if I can get my screen to cooperate with me, is a brief look at what different religious groups in America have to say about this particular issue. And I'm recognizing that uh, something has gone terribly wrong with my projector, so give me a second. If this does not show up, I will simply fill you in on the details while it's warming up. In terms of the breakdown of religious traditions in America, Christianity is in the 70 percentile in terms of what percentage of religious people claim adherence to a particular religious view. Almost every other group that you look at is one to two percent or lower, though there are some uh, discrepancies when it comes to trying to figure out what percentage of the population is Muslim. Someone tell me if anything shows up on the screen behind me. Uh, Buddhism, for example, represents about 7% of the population. There is no universal statement about same-sex marriage from Buddhism. There are some branches of Buddhism that suggest that one of the uh, non-virtuous deeds, which is called sexual misconduct, may refer to same-sex marriage or homosexuality, but most of them believe it refers to adultery. Hinduism, which makes up about 0.4% of the U.S. population, has no official position on same-sex marriage. There are discrepancies, once again, depending on how you read the Kama Sutra. Some see it as allowing it, some don't. Islam makes up from about 0.6% of the U.S. population to maybe 2%, depending which polls you read. Uh, Islamic law does forbid homosexuality and same-sex marriage, and it's a crime in many Islamic countries, though if you uh, have heard what Islamic politicians have said in America, they have come down in favor of same-sex marriage. Judaism makes up a little under 2% of the U.S. population. You have three or four main branches of Judaism. Uh, you have the Reform and Re Reconstructionist Jewish movement, and they've supported same-sex marriage since the mid-90s. The conservative Jewish movement has recently approved a ceremony for same-sex couples Orthodox Judaism does not accept same-sex marriage. All this information, by the way, is from the Pew Forum on Religion and the Public Life, which I think is a fairly reputable organization. So if you visit their website, the article is entitled Religious Groups Official Positions on Same-Sex Marriage, and you can find more there. Uh, Catholic Protestant makes up about 78% of the population. Agnostic, atheist, or nothing in particular is about 18%. And of that 78% of Christian, about 55% or so is Protestant. So what I'm going to represent for the rest of this is the Protestant position, since it is the primary view that is affecting the public discussion. Uh, I grew up in the Protestant tradition. I've been a Protestant all my life. I've interacted with a number of different traditions. And what I'm going to try to do tonight is represent two different sides of this discussion. One is the what I'll call the historic Christian tradition one that for quite some time has represented a particular view of marriage. The other I'll call the postmodern Christian position or maybe the emergent Christian position. In the last 10 to 20 years, there has been a push within Protestant Christianity uh, to redefine marriage and to be more open to the idea of same-sex marriage. So what I'm gonna try to do is represent both sides of these uh, perspectives accurately. Uh, I'll go through a template with the first traditional view and then I'll try to use the same one to go through the postmodern view as well. But I want to clarify a couple things, first of all. One, this is what this presentation is not. This is not a representation of the fringes. I don't speak for Westboro Baptist. I don't find them defensible. It's not a commentary on the quality of same-sex relationships or the character of those who are in them. Uh, too often I cringe when I hear the conversation that takes place from Christians or among Christians, I feel like it's inflammatory and it is not helpful to discussions and it harms relationships. This is not a presentation that will claim same-sex marriage erodes traditional marriage. Uh, if you've seen the stats, you'll know that traditional marriage is doing a sufficient job of eroding <laughs> itself without any help. And while both sides of this discussion would like to see something about public policy, reflect their opinion on the subject. The point of my presentation is not public policy. 
Uh, that's specifically why Scott was talking about more of the legal perspective on it. There's lots of arguments that are taking place about this from more of a, uh, a neutral, a secular, choose the word you want, perspective. My purpose is not to engage with that kind of article, argument. Here's what this is. It's a representation of the reasons that Christians have traditionally claimed that marriage is a particular kind of institution. Uh, it'll make the fundamental claim that Christians believe that the worldview as presented in the Bible is intended to match reality. And while I recognize that's not a view shared by everyone, uh, because Christians believe that, they draw from lots of other sources of knowledge, such as history, sociology, biology, philosophy, science, and reason, because the claim would be that all knowledge properly understood will lead to truth, and that could be knowledge from many different venues. Christian tradition has identified what people currently refer to as traditional marriage as a purposefully unique institution in which families are formed, children are raised, and societies are best enabled to flourish. Now, the emergent Christian position challenges that to some degree, and we will look at that at the second part of this presentation. By the way, I have handouts where all this is written out. If, those have, if you're interested in later having something that you can see that's not just a fleeting slide, you're welcome to pick them up. Uh, first of all, the historical Christian view would borrow from ontology. They would make the claim that there's an objective nature to things. Think perhaps of Plato's realm of the ideal, where he said there's an ideal form, and in the created world we see uh, images or representations of that form, but there's something that's ideal. So that would be an ontological claim about the nature of marriage, that just as male and female um, are a particular thing, justice is a particular thing, and marriage is a particular thing. So there's an ideal form of marriage. The second point would be a teleological one, and that is the belief that things are made or created with a particular purpose in mind. So there's an end goal for everything. In this case, men and women are obviously different, and they're complementary, and specifically they're generative. That is, when men and women have sex, they have babies. Not every time, but that's the process by which babies come into the world. The complementary biological nature of a man and a woman and the unitive nature of sex act as a signal about the framework in which the raising and nurturing of children takes place, and that is marriage. Marriage is then ideally, by ideally I mean going back to this kind of platonic image of there's something that exists of which everything here represents in some fashion, is a complementarian institution in which men and women conceive and raise their own children in a setting that is loving, nurturing, committed, and stable. And once again, the, the claim is not that that is what every marriage is. The claim is that there is a definition of marriage, a form of marriage, that is something to strive for. Uh, sociologically speaking, uh, the Christian tradition would point at studies that have been done, and Scott mentioned these briefly, and I think we're probably going to talk about an article at the end that, that deals more with this issue. They would quote sociology to note that a stable, low-conflict, faithful marriage between the biological mother and father provide children with the statistically healthiest home. Um, I have sources for this, and when I give the emergent view, I will also have sources that make a different claim. Once again, if you'd like to see the source of the information, pick up handouts afterwards. This does not claim that all other situations result in unhealthy kids, or that they are necessarily unstable, full of conflict, or unfaithful. It simply claims there's a generally predictable situation in which children flourish. Uh, historically speaking, Christian tradition would note that vastly different societies all around the world, some religious, some not, uh, have largely recognized the uniqueness of marriage. Uh, even in the context of when the Bible was written in Greek and Roman culture, though there were a lot of expressions of sexuality that were part of the normative life of their cultures, uh, even marriage itself as an institution was unique. The Christian claim about marriage would affirm a concept that seems to transcend religions and cultures. The conclusion, the historical Christian concept of marriage makes a claim about purpose and design. That is, men and women are purposefully different and complementary. Complementary in sex is both generative and unitive. And the more a child's origin and maturation align, that is, the, in other words, the family in which they are conceived is the family which raises them, the better the odds that he or she will flourish. Same-sex couples clearly love each other and desire to form unions in which children also flourish. But if the previous description of marriage is true, then their committed institution, no matter how compelling, by definition is something other than marriage. Now in the last, oh, sorry, one more slide. 
Some historical Christians favor civil unions or another form of sanctioned commitment ceremonies because they believe Christians ought to support faithfulness, commitment, and enduring love in whatever way they can with the ceremony that promotes this. And in fact, a growing number are suggesting we separate church marriage from state marriage, just to make a distinction, let the state decide what it would like to uh, signify or honor as marriage and let the church decide what they would like to do as well. All right, the postmodern Christian view or the emergent Christian view. They would say there is not necessarily an ontological or objective nature to social institutions such as marriage. God has given us the leeway to both define and describe it, and now we're thinking more like Aristotle than Plato. Uh, to use a practical example, and I'm doing a tremendous disservice to both Plato and Aristotle by summarizing all their thought into just short paragraphs. <laughs> so if that's what you're thinking, I agree with you. Uh, let's try to work with this analogy. Plato would have said that there's this ideal chair, and that every time you see a chair, it participates in chairishness. And as we see these chairs, the more we see, the more we'll gain an idea of what that ideal looks like. But they're all simply secondary representations. Aristotle would have said that there is no ideal cherishness out there, but that as we look at chairs, we can collectively get to know better what, that, what the best chair might look like. Uh, so Plato's is more of a, of a top down and Aristotle's is more of a bottom up. So the claim here about marriage would be that marriage is not this ideal that we are trying to to see clearly, marriage, we will see it clearly as we see all the different ways in which marriage is experienced. The biblical discussion then of marriage reflects the societal mores and norms of the time in which it was written. And at that time, only differently gendered couples were granted the privilege of marriage. Um, if you've read history, you know that the Greeks and Romans uh, expressed sexuality in quite a variety of ways. But my understanding is that in terms of legal recognition by the government, it was only differently gendered couples. The, Postmodern Christian view would say that the biblical discussion of marriage then reflects some norms of the time. They would go on to claim then that it's time to broaden the sanctioned community of commitment, love, and faithfulness. They would note that men and women are different and complementary biologically, but other differences may simply reflect societal expectations about male and female. In other words, the complementarianism that we discuss in terms of gender roles or expectations, uh, they would see as more fluid. Same-sex couples can now have and raise children thanks to the God-given creativity and technological advances. So the complementarian argument about biology is one that technology uh, has in essence done away with. They would further say biblical conclusions were based on cultural constraints and that marriage is actually an institution in which committed socially complementarian partners can also raise children in a setting that is loving, nurturing, committed, and stable. They would look at the studies from sociology and would say that same-sex couples obviously love each other and marriage is the official way to affirm the presence of love. Children are meant to be raised within the framework of love and commitment and same-sex marriage provides this. Considering that so many opposite-sex couples have very dysfunctional relationships, it's time to try an alternative that achieves the Christian ideal of faithfulness, commitment, and enduring love. Once again, I have sources. I know they're hard to read on the screen. If you pick up a handout afterwards, you could visit some websites that discuss that more. Historically, they would note that, for example, when the Bible was written, same-sex relationships were very different than they are now. It was written at a time when ancient Near East or Old Testament and Greek and Roman culture had no examples of same-sex relationships as we understand them now. A narrow stance on marriage that was necessary then to promote faithfulness, commitment, and enduring love is no longer necessary. Uh, there's quite the discussion in Christian circles about how to understand particular Greek words as they reference uh, different relationships and sexual activity. And finally, the Creator allows for same-sex marriage. They would argue that God has created people with the same-sex attraction, and the definition and role of marriage ought to be broadened to accommodate the modern understanding of human sexuality, one that was simply not known at the time the Bible was written. The church then can and should acknowledge the union of same-sex couples as marriage as it promotes an environment that includes the Christian ideals of stability, commitment, and fidelity. The state then should recognize and regulate marriage in the interest of stable romantic partnership <coughs> and the needs of spouses and any children they choose to raise. The biblical discussion of marriage reflects the societal mores and norms of the time. I think I said this paragraph already, and I'll skip to the conclusion. It's time to broaden the sanctioned community of commitment, love, and faithfulness. Uh, as you might expect, the controversy within Christian circles is 
a lively one. Uh, there's lots of stuff to be read on the article. But in general, those are the two positions that you are going to see uh, Christians disagreeing about. It's obviously going to have an influence as you discuss with Christians what their opinion of same-sex marriage is. They're going to interact with you based on what their foundational principles are uh, in terms of that particular issue. So I'm going to sit down before you ask me questions. <laughs> Um, well, one of the questions I want to ask you um, is, especially within the Christian or Protestant circles, there's not a central leadership figure like the Catholic Church has. So there's really not a way to come to a uniform consensus in the body of the church. It's, it's very divided or up to individual congregations to make that decision. Um, one thing I think is interesting is the, the first viewpoint that you mentioned, a lot of Christians reference the Bible and believe that their understanding of the Bible says that homosexual relationships are sinful. And then the emergent Christian maybe say that we're interpreting that the wrong way or that was based on the social norms of the time or whatever the case might be. Um, so my question is, um, as this issue continues to become more socially relevant, if we get to a point where same-sex marriages are just accepted by the culture, will the church, particularly the part of the church that believes that homosexuality is sinful, need to adapt to stay socially relevant, even if that means compromising their viewpoint? Or do you think that there will be an exodus from the traditional church to the emergent church because it better reflects the social mores of the country? Right. Does that question make sense? Yeah, I'm going to paraphrase what you said just sure. a little bit so we stay focused on the topic of marriage as opposed to uh, the topic of homosexuality. Sure. Um, you'll, where you will see the church respond differently is, once again, what their idea of marriage is. Is marriage the type of institution that is simply one thing by definition? And, and thus nothing else can be marriage. So the first half of the presentation I gave, if you're building from the idea that marriage is this kind of Platonic ideal, for those of you who might not be as familiar with Christianity, Plato and Aristotle both were very influential in a lot of the um, clarifying of Christian thought. They borrowed on them heavily. There's some different traditions that, that pull from both of them. So, if you're building from this idea that there is this, that marriage is a particular thing, and that even no matter what we do to describe it or to express it in different ways, only one particular expression of it is marriage, um, which I feel like is a discussion that's distinct from some of the other uh, side trails we could go down. Then, of course, a church that takes that position is not going to sanction a same sex marriage because they don't think it's marriage. It, it can be a committed union, it might be a civil union, or there's lots of other terms that could be used, but they, they would not see it as possible to do it. Uh, I was thinking of this today, like if, if someone would say to me, um, hey, I, I, draw a, I drew a square, and I would say, what kind of square is it? They would look at me quizzically, it's a four-sided one, because that's what squares are. And in that context, the question would make sense. So that is, the first part of the presentation I gave thinks of marriage in that way. If someone would say, what kind of marriage is it? They would have the same kind of response because they would see marriage as a particular thing. Um, obviously, the, the second, the postmodern Christian perspective would not see it that way. They'd see it much more fluidly, that we do have the right to redefine it in ways that respond to uh, what is trending in cultures or in response to what the church wishes to affirm about what is happening in culture. Maybe they see it as an opportunity uh, to let people know that the church stands for certain <coughs> things. I, I forget the three words I use now. Uh, faithfulness, committedness. Um, stability. Stability. Yeah, and so even if they would be uncertain about what to do with it as marriage, they would see it as an opportunity for the church to affirm particular things in a society that they think are important. Do you think, um, and this just... I know this is speculative because you, you don't represent or speak for the entire Christian community, but um, is it, do you see that the, the majority of the church, is it disingenuous to, I guess, separate homosexuality from same-sex marriage? I know for the purposes of our discussion tonight, we are, but many Christians' viewpoints on same-sex marriage seem to be informed by their views on same-sex relationships right. um, and whether those are appropriate or not. So do you see see that it would be possible for the church to come to one conclusion about 
same-sex activity or relationships and a different about marriage. A common concession is that the church might be okay with civil unions among gays, but not right. the marriage concept. Do your studies bring anything oh, that's up? That's a great like question, that? Beth. Um, I'm trying to think of an analogy. A number of years ago, I was talking with uh, a couple that I didn't know well, and when they introduced themselves to me, um, they said they were married. And as I talked with them, I discovered they'd never gone through any type of for formal ceremony. They, I think they had taken a, a walk on a beach and agreed they'd be married. And I, I know at times in history and other cultures, they do it differently. But in America, that's obviously not the way we get married. Uh, and so my comment to them was, but you're not married. Um, because marriage is a particular thing. And it didn't, I wasn't angry at them. I wasn't. I, I just felt it was a misrepresentation of the word. You clearly have a relationship. They'd lived together for years. You're clearly, uh, your lives are intertwined with each other and you love each other. I, I understand all that, but it's not marriage. It's something different. So I, I guess I would think of the, the question in that context that even if the church would take a perspective, let's say all of the church says, you know what, we were wrong about homosexuality. Uh, we're perfectly fine with it. And everybody would say that. I think you'd still have a difference of opinion about whether or not that would mean you could include that relationship as marriage. So uh, I need to think more about that. That's a good question, Beth. So the distinction would be that what's being protected is this ideal of marriage being right. between a man and a woman, and it's not in opposition to homosexuality, which is how it's often portrayed in the public sphere. Yes, and I, I think Christians have not done a good job of trying to separate um, whatever emotion they're bringing to the argument from trying to make a distinction that the, if they're going to take a stance in the historical Christian perspective that marriage is a particular thing, they're not taking that stance because they want to demean or diminish other people who are trying to make committed lives together. They're taking that stance, I think often with, with a sense of frustration that it's causing the rift that it is, but they feel like it's not up to them to define what it is. It's been defined, and that is out of their hands, so to speak. Okay. Does that yeah. make sense? Sure. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you both about is um, this idea of gender roles, and for anyone in the audience, the um, cover uh, story for the, this month's issue of The Atlantic deals with gay marriage. It's a really interesting article. Um, I definitely recommend you check it out. But one of the things the article posits is that um, research is showing that gay marriage, or couples in gay marriage, are reporting higher levels of intimacy and satisfaction um, than straight marriage. And one of the reasons for that is because um, when two people of the same sex enter into a marriage relationship, they don't come in with the standard gender roles that they come into that relationship. So it's not assumed, for example, that the man will handle the money and the woman will handle the children. When two people of the same gender enter, they have to sort of build from the ground up what their roles are going to be in that relationship, and it, it allows for more equitable um, division of labor in the relationship. Um, the same is true for sex, that uh, gay couples are reporting higher levels of satisfaction with their sex lives because there's more communication required, um, which is not always the case for straight couples. Um, so I have specific things I want to ask about this idea of gender roles to both of you, and maybe, Scott, I'll start with you. Um, from a legal precedent, um, gender roles are, have played some, some role in the history of the court. Um, particularly with marriage, originally you know, women were seen as property. So any sort of legal issues would be handled through the husband. Now women are seen as their own individuals and they represent themselves in a, a legal situation. Um, even today though we have things like divorce hearings and custody hearings. There's at least an impression in the public that maybe gender roles play some role in that, that a, a mother might be more considered as a suitable custodial parent than a father, or men might be underrepresented in divorce hearings. Um, do you think if we had an, an advance of same-sex relationships that this idea that gender roles or preconceived gender roles might dissolve, might that help things like that in a, a court or legal setting? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess what I would say is, with gender specifically, the way the equal to protection issue has evolved is as we've kind of corrected some of these past wrongs, um, 
courts are kind of looking more closely at suspect classifications as opposed to suspect classes um, in this context. So basically saying there just shouldn't be any laws really that regard, that differentiate on the basis of man versus woman outside of the marriage context. Um, so with like divorce things, like those may have been things even you know a few years ago, but you're seeing that less and less. Um, everything is a little bit more discretionary based on the exact circumstances. Um, basically, I mean, affirmative action would be a good example. If you want to have an affirmative action program where you have um, an employer who sets out to specifically hire women, the only way that could legally be allowed is if you could point to an actual history of women being discriminated against in that actual workplace. Um, if you just decide, I want more women in the workplace, that's, that's discrimination on the other side and you can't have that kind of um, law or that kind of policy. So I guess as, as gender roles go away, I guess you would see less need to remedy these um, past wrongs and you would see even less differentiation as laws go forward. Hmm. Um, and Anthony, from the religious community perspective, um, specifically from a, a Christian perspective, and you can talk about it either in the traditional or the emergent form, um, gender does seem, there are a lot of religions, particularly Christianity, do seem to have some characteristics or roles assigned to genders. You see, um, you know, there's some famous biblical verses about women submitting to their husbands, or um, the church has talked about metaphorically as being the bride of Christ. Um, if there were to be this uh, delusion or, or disillusion of gender roles because we accept more same-sex marriage, do you perceive that as being a threatening thing to the church and could that be some of the basis of their resistance to, to homosexuality? Yes, I, th I think it could be some of the basis of the resistance. But in my opinion, I don't think the resistance is called for. Um, I think that a return to a biblical perspective of genders is a far more equitable one than has often been expressed throughout Christian history. In fact, if we even look at the history of Christian marriage vows, they change over the centuries. So, you know, every hundred, several hundred years, you'll have different language coming up in marriage vows, and you'll see a reflection of something that's happening culturally in terms of expectations of what people do in the home or how a wife and husband are supposed to interact. But I don't think those reflections are often necessarily a reflection of a biblical presentation of the complementary way in which, in which men and women, while unique, um, often intersect with each other's uh, traditional, I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for, ways in which we traditionally think about men and women. So even for example, let's go back to the Old Testament. You have some of your greatest warriors who are women, uh, not just the men. You have stories of someone like Esther who's a queen and who changes the course of a nation as a political leader. Uh, you get into the New Testament and you see women playing roles in the church that in many ways women don't play anymore that seem to be a far more significant role. Uh, for those who are familiar with the Bible, there's a verse in Proverbs that's classically uh, talked about representing the Proverbs 31 woman. And she's an entrepreneur. She's a businessman. She is, uh, if we were to update it into modern terms and maybe check the message for that, uh, she would be doing a little bit of everything. So I, I think there has, over the years, crept into the Christian tradition a, a satisfaction or maybe even a stagnation with some ways in which men and women are understood or expected to interact with each other or with their kids or in the workforce. And I, I don't think it's an un unhealthy thing for the church to be forced to revisit um, what is it about men and women that is both unique uh, and yet meant to uh, work together and bolster each other. Okay. Um, I want to make sure you guys have time to ask your questions, so maybe this would be a good time to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions? And again, just keep in mind what we said. <laughs> yeah, right there. Um, my question is for Scott. Um, because some states have gay marriage legalized and some don't, so they're giving out marriage licenses to same-sex couples, why isn't the full faith and credit clause not coming into question, um, especially in the Supreme Court uh, cases? Um, yeah, I think the Defense of Marriage Act is what kind of gets in the way of that. that that act specifically says that um, 
states do not have to honor the marriages granted by other states. Um, and how that's come to the Supreme Court now and what the Supreme Court is deciding is basically there's a same-sex couple married in a certain state and moved to a state where their marriage wasn't recognized. Um, one of them died in that state and because of, they were relatively wealthy, um, because of inheritance laws or probate laws, instead of uh, the spouse just getting all the money, which she would have if the marriage was recognized, she ended up having to pay like $300,000 or something in taxes to the state. Uh, because she was just recognized as a roommate. Um, so that's sort of uh, the underlying facts of this case that's being decided. But I believe um, DOMA kind of um, supersedes the full faith and credit clause in that context. For those in the audience who don't know, could you explain what full faith and credit means? Yeah, um, basically that, if I understand it correctly, um, if there's a law in one state that that law is also effective in all other states and states state governments acknowledge the laws of other states okay good question i saw a couple of, yeah. um, i have a problem with my points um when uh, the question is for you and, uh, I, my feeling is that a lot of this difficulty is because there's no clear cut between church and state and uh, from, from the perspective of the more traditional Christian perspective, uh, if a straight couple gets married only with a, uh, what do you call, not, not in a church, not in church, but with just a, a, civil, a civil ceremony. A civil ceremony. So from that perspective in which uh, marriage is something, so this straight couple, that's not a marriage? So you're asking if the church is not part of the ceremony, is it still a marriage? From that, from that point of view, from that more traditional Christian point of view, if marriage is something, you know, uh, so if it's just a legal or civil marriage, it wouldn't be a marriage, a true marriage before their eyes? So maybe another way to ask this is, is the church defining marriage as a union between a man and a woman, whether that's sanctioned specifically by the church or by the government, or does the church have to be part of the ceremony? Hmm. Uh, my understanding is the definition would be an officially sanctioned union between a man and a woman. Uh, so uh, yeah, I do think a civil ceremony does that. That's the way in which we governmentally officially sanction it. Now, I read an article this week of a trending movement where people are not going to the courts at all, and they're simply doing ceremonies within their church. Uh, a part of the ripple effect of that is that there is no recognition by the state that they're a married couple, which raises a lot of difficulties for them down the road. Um, so in a very practical sense, for one, I, I think it's important that you do that. Um, but the officially sanctioned, I, I think there's some leeway on how to understand that. Let's say, for example, that Christians live in a country where there's severe persecution, uh, which is happening around the world some places. And if they were to try to do a public ceremony <coughs> where their church performed a wedding ceremony and they also did a civil union ceremony at the same time, that what would result from that was persecution because of the Christian aspect of it. If they would choose to have a ceremony within their church, out of fear of repercussions from uh, persecution, would that mean it wasn't a marriage? I don't think so because it's an, the community came together and officially sanctioned it as a recognition of this is what marriage is. So I, I can think of enough examples where there would be unusual situations um, that it, the, the language of an official sanctioning uh, can carry can cover a lot of things, but I think it's the best language I have for it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. So it has to be an officially sanctioned? Yeah. By whoever, state or state. Right. Barring, you know, I, I remember, I used, I, used, I used to talk with friends about the scenario, what if you're shipwrecked on an island and there's just, there's just me and another lady, um, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives? Uh, would God consider if we tried to make a life together we weren't married because no, no one was there to sanction it? Okay, I can always come up with exceptions like that, but I don't think exceptions are the things that you use to try to, to come up with a, a generally correct theory. 
Do you think, just as a follow-up, Anthony, if, if we were to get to a point where there was a, a government sanctioned ceremony, like a civil union, and we separated them out and had a, also a church ceremony, because of the issues we talked about with not having a centralized leadership for the church, could that become then like the states where it, it mm -hmm. sort of causes infighting because some churches say that they'll yeah. grant marriages and, and some will not? Yes, I think it could. Okay, just I'm curious. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the Christian historical perspective for marriage, and and then we just talked a little bit about civil unions. And I I could be wrong on this, but I thought that our government didn't really get involved in marriage until the mid 1800s. And so, we're, how far back does your um, your history, Christian history, go defining marriage? I mean, does it go back 150 years to the to the civil marriage and, and church marriage, or does it go back 200 years when we didn't have a government-sanctioned marriage and people just made uh, decisions among families? Like, like the couple you met on the beach did, right. that you said was, you know, was, wasn't a marriage in your mind, but maybe 200 years ago would have been. That's, that's my question. Then. Right, you would still have a community that was officially sanctioning it. Yeah. Uh, Two hundred years ago, I have not read a lot of history of what was happening with marriage two hundred years ago, so I don't know how much the government was involved and how much they left it up to local communities. But the idea is that there's a there's a community aspect to marriage. Um, the marriage isn't just something that is privately thought about and, and decided, but there's a, a sanctioning of it that takes place as a recognition. Um, with the relevant parties, the relevant people involved. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know my history from 200 years ago, so I can't answer more directly what you're referring to in that situation. Well, can I ask you this? Um, just for the sake of people who are, from a traditional definition of marriage, could you talk about maybe what you see as the essential components of that? We talked about a male and a female. You just mentioned the element of community. Is there an element, uh, the church thinks there's an element of recognition before God, is that? And I guess, my, I guess my other question would be like things like arranged marriages, does there have to be individual consent as well? Or what would you see as the components of a traditional marriage? Wow. I you just guys, threw a lot at him, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> I prepared for a whole bunch of other questions, but not this series of questions. Uh, I would see more as the, the formal arrangement and the formal recognition of a covenant and a commitment that has been made. Um, so even an arranged marriage, and I'm not suggesting arranged marriages were ideal, but even arranged marriages, there was a, a formal covenant and commitment that was made. Um, and, and I think in the other scenarios that you're describing, there is a formal process in which covenants and commitments are made. Sometimes it involves the state, sometimes it doesn't. Um, in the example that you gave, apparently 200 years ago, the state didn't care so if obviously the state wasn't going to be the group that formalized what was happening. Well, I think, you know, you know years ago, it was, it was two families that made an agreement. And some goods might have changed hands or, or this and that, but there, there wasn't ever a state. Uh, the state wasn't in a position to, to legalize a marriage. So it was basically two families that made that decision. I mean, that's, that's the only, you know, one of the reasons that, that I even bring it up is because we, we were involved in a culture that um, people couldn't afford the state legalized marriage in, in masses. And, they, and so they, they couldn't get married, and so they just cohabitate. It's just kind of their life now. And, and so you, you have to think, well, these 2,000 people are cohabitating because they, they can't uh, follow the guidelines of the state. Is that, is that marriage? You know, or do you, you just say all those kids are bastard kids? You know, I mean, I, I guess I had to say, well, they, they're married. You know, I had to rethink marriage because because of the dynamics the state was putting on marriage, or the, the costs they're putting on. Marriage. Which is one reason uh, some Christians argue that the state really ought not have an interest in being the one that ultimately decides that. Now, be that as it may, I think for a lot of legal reasons, it's important that there be some standard that the state can recognize how it wants to treat particular people. I don't know the culture you were in. My initial response would be, 
Let's say here in Traverse City, I discovered that just a lot of people were not getting married because they couldn't afford it. They didn't have the money to jump through all the legal hoops. I would sure hope that the church would step up and, and officially sanction their relationships in a, in a situation that creates an undual hardship. Uh, I, I would hope that the church would be resilient enough to do that. Um, I, I can't speak more to what the church did in the situation in which you were in. Any other questions? Okay. I'd like to push you a little bit more. Anthony. I figured you would, Steve. You probably know what I'm going to ask you, but uh, in in the traditional historical description of Christianity that you of Christianity's view on marriage, uh, it seemed to draw a lot on on just a general broad definition of marriage as it's been known throughout various cultures and sort of this platonic ideal. I didn't see a lot that was specifically Christian about it that seemed to be different from just traditional or conservative or something like that. Um, and I, I wonder if the reason that, for that is that if you start drawing on specifically Christian sources for information about marriage, um, you start having to ask questions about marriages in the Old Testament, sure. which includes explicit sanction of you know, marriage to war captives right. against their will, an explicit sanction of marriage with one man and multiple women. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about how the traditional Christian view manages to exclude those types of marriage which appear to be sanctioned by God while preserving something and how that's uh, specifically Christian. Sure. Uh, basic Christian thought would say that you see a culmination of ideas in the Old Testament that kind of come together with the arrival of Jesus. So in the teaching of Jesus and in the follow-up teaching through the letters in the rest of the New Testament, you see, you see a goal of what the Old Testament was pushing toward. So what you see in the Old Testament is a progressive movement toward a particular end, an incremental movement. So you don't see in the Old Testament the full expression of a particular uh, institution such as marriage. So let's take, for example, you read in the New Testament letters, one of the requirements for someone who was a leadership in the church it was that they're a husband of one wife. And all the discussion in the New Testament and in the early church documents have to do with that particular refinement of it. Uh, you, you read things like when Jesus said, when he talked with the people about the question of divorce, he said to them at one point, Moses allowed particular things with you because of the hardness of your heart, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that wasn't the end, I'm paraphrasing, that wasn't the end goal. Um, there were concessions made that were not ideal in the process of moving you to this place. And I, I understand a lot of the Old Testament to be a record of concessions that were made that were incremental portions in a journey. Does that make sense? So, so if, if we accept that sort of angle as, as a representative of the, of the traditional view, then what would be the argument, the counter argument to this? If there's been a progression in the definition of marriage, then we are still progressing. Yes, that's something called trajectory hermeneutics, to throw my big words out. Um, <laughs> There is a movement that says that when the New Testament ended, it had simply clarified the, the direction of the trajectory. The emergent movement or the postmodern Christian movement would build on that. And they would say, for example, that when you read in the New Testament, um, the descriptions of how a husband and wife ought to interact with each other, or um, how women are supposed to act, or how men are supposed to act, that was happening in response to certain cultural realities where the church was trying to create um, a safe haven in the midst of a lot of unfortunate things. And I know that's a bold statement to make, um, and I don't know if I have time to go in it, but I will be at the Blue Tractor afterwards. Um, and so they would say, for example, what the church was trying to do is create a community of people in which the most marginalized and oppressed in society found freedom and found a voice. They would argue that that trajectory means as the church continues to unfold, it needs to find the most marginalized in society and give them safety and give them a voice. Uh, yes, that's, that's the trajectory hermeneutic. Obviously the opposite of that would be to say, with the arrival of Jesus and the teaching in the New Testament, the, the end goal was presented. 
our job then is to try to understand how to live it out in constantly shifting cultures because there would be timeless principles expressed in a timely way. And so um, it, it's a challenging discussion. Um, even in the historical Christian circles, there's a lot, of, a lot of discussion about how to understand principles that were applied in a particular way then. How do we apply them now? Uh, yes, that's an ongoing debate. Did that answer your question? Well, I can keep going, but yeah, I think it, I think it contributed to it. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. glad I could contribute. More questions? Yeah. Proponents of gay marriage and uh, objectors to it might still agree that all individuals should have equal rights under the law. So if there were such a thing as a civil union for gay couples, and they could enjoy all the exact same benefits under the law, regarding inheritance and hospital visitation and, and such, then the only argument that remains is who gets to claim the meaning of the word marriage, like the meaning of the word square, right? And at that point, I think the movement has succeeded. It's done. It's, uh, because we know that the meaning of words change as the meaning of the word gay has changed dramatically. So if we get to the point where the only argument is the claim on the meaning of a word, aren't we done? <laughs> How would you guys react to that? You, I've talked a lot. Especially, well, first. Scott, maybe because words I'll, have I'll legal words have legal connotations as well. Yeah, um, I, I I see what you're saying. I guess I would have to say, you know, a lot of existing state constitutions and laws use that term marriage, and even if I don't. I don't know. I guess. I guess you would have have to ask the, you know, people who are in the shoes of outside looking in on this uh, term marriage and everything that means, whether it would be enough, you know, to just avail of yourself of, you know, tax benefits and those types of things as opposed to the term itself, because I think, you know, I guess what you're asking for is is that marital definition. Um, you're not asking for necessarily a ceremony in a church. You're asking for this thing that you could go down to the courthouse and sign with a couple of witnesses and be a part of. Um, I guess at the same, I don't know, I, I guess perhaps, you know, proponents of same-sex marriage or same-sex rights would be okay with that to the same extent that people who are married now would be with, okay with the state saying, okay, now nobody gets married. Everybody has a civil union and marriage is just this thing that churches can do. I think it would be, I don't know, it's, it seems like Perhaps it's a distinction without a difference, as, as you said, but um, I don't know, it just seems to have some meaning. Anthony, what do you think? Uh, I have a couple thoughts. One is a literary thought. Uh, I was highly influenced by George Orwell's 1984 and some of the things he wrote about the power of language. And from it's, it's been a number of years since I read Orwell, but from what I remember, he was a big proponent of the importance of uh, something stable in words. I'm doing a bad job of paraphrasing Orwell, but in his dystopian future, one of the problems of the future was that language meanings were so constantly changed that people lost the ability to think clearly because they didn't have the words to put around their thoughts. And I, that's influenced a lot of my thinking about the nature of language. I think language is crucial. I was an English major in college too. I think there's something to words um, that are important and that we change definitions more often than not, uh, not as a good thing, but as, as something that can be detrimental if we're not careful. I know some, some casual words change. I recognize living languages do that. But I, I think there's something to be said for defending as much as possible the value of the meaning of words. I know that opens up a whole philosophy can on language. Um, so I'm not going to say anything more about that because it's not our topic tonight. And now I lost track of the second thing I was going to say, Scott. I'll try to remember what it was. As you're thinking about that, I mean, wouldn't a counter argument be, I think a lot of gay advocates are, are asking for the right to not just have the legal benefits but the term marriage because there seems to be a societal status attached to that term. There seems to be a, condone, a condoning by society and a, and a recognition of, of the relationship 
that comes with that term. And that's, it's a, it seems to be a prized term that gay advocates aren't just asking for the same legal rights, they want to be recognized in a societal way. Um, so you were talking about defending it, um, but some people are also saying, why, couldn't, why can't I have that? Yeah, and I guess my response, and I feel like I've, this has taken a philosophical rather than a religious turn. Um, my response to that is, if marriage is a particular thing, and if that's the case, and I recognize that not everyone agrees with that, but if that's true, it doesn't matter what my opinion is about um, the institution or the way in which people uh, want to experience it differently. I would feel like um, it was something that transcended my opinion of it. Like a square. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay, Scott, I remember what I was going to say. Uh, tell me if this is a helpful analogy. Let's take a concept like justice. Uh, obviously, different cultures and at different times, we've sought to implement justice in a particular way. But I think we believe that underneath there, there's such a thing as justice, that, that is, there's a fair response. Of, I don't know a particularly legal, do you have a good legal definition for me, Scott, for justice? But so while we might try in different ways to achieve justice, and while it might look differently as we try to achieve it, it wouldn't mean that the ideal or, or justice itself had changed it, its, its nature. Um, whereas if I'm eating dessert and I'm trying to decide if something is sweet or not, that might change quite a bit based on how much I've had and uh, how hungry I am. So is marriage something like justice or is marriage something like sweet? And if you take the position that marriage is something like justice, then, then even the, the conversation about what are the different ways in which we can have marriage, um, it doesn't connect with the type of word or the type of concept that you think, that someone would think it is. Was that, did that clarify or did that just muddy it? It does, no, actually it does. And I think Beth hit it, hit the answer nicely. What, what advocates of gay marriage are looking for is the societal meaning is the, they're looking for something more than legal rights. They're looking for a, a societal recognition. And I think by letting justice mean justice and letting marriage mean what marriage means and allowing them to claim that meaning, that's what they seek. And I agree with that. I mean, I, I think they should uh, have a right to that word. Do you think the, the way that we've been talking about marriage being defined, is that, would, you, would the argument be from the church trying to phrase this the right way, does that have a secular bearing? In other words, does that definition, the church would say that that's because God has ordained this relationship to look like this, like a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. A square is a square regardless of what your religious beliefs are. So do you have to, I mean, how would you convince an atheist or someone who doesn't believe in God that the ideal of marriage is a man and woman, that you have to come to them on a basis that's not ordained from God. Right, I agree. I don't, I'm not sure I have a basis to do that because um, our fundamental disagreements are, go much further back than that. Um, yeah. I guess I'm trying to say why, why should the church have the authority to define marriage versus secular culture? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I guess what I would ask is what gives anyone the right then to define marriage? So I don't, I mean, I understand the concern that Christians want to dominate the discussion and define it for everybody else. But the reality is that whatever law is ultimately decided, someone will have defined it for everybody else. You can't get away from that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's where uh, I, I think it's important that everyone boldly state their case and you've got a marketplace of ideas in which you discuss it. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, someone's perspective will not be implemented in law and someone's perspective will become, um, normative is not the word, uh, it, it will have force on everyone else. So I don't think you can get around that fact that it, it, is, a, it is a clash that uh, has significance for what happens societally, but I, I think everybody's on the same level playing field when it comes to that. Makes sense. I think we have time maybe for one more question, if there is one, and are there any more questions? If not, we can go for it. <laughs> So are we really talking about the legal definition? And if we're talking about the legal definition under a secular government, then certainly there's an influence by the population. But if the purpose of marriage from the view of our government is a legal contract between two people, 
shouldn't that be where the definition stems from? And I guess I'm asking you, Scott, if we're talking about there always being a legal definition to a word, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, personally, yeah, I think I very much agree with you. I think that is where, you know, the battle lines are kind of drawn. Um, and it goes kind of to like the standing issue that I was talking about. Um, if, if you're arguing against this type of law that allows same-sex marriage in open court, you have to say with a straight face that you're going to be harmed by the fact that these gay marriages exist. Um, without that, you have no place, you have no basis for arguing that. So I think, I mean, there has to be yeah. It, but there's no other, I guess I'll rephrase my question. There's no other legal definition for any kind of contract, maybe I'm not phrasing this correctly, that would be gender specific, right? When, when you're talking about equality of, you know, in those five ways to determine, right? So this would be a precedent, wouldn't it? Where you're, you're making a legal definition for something that is some kind of contract that's specific to gender. Yeah. I think so. The law is being concerned with how many penises are involved, right? <laughs> you can I say. think that's the best way to sum up that debate. Yeah, right <laughs> yeah I, I think so. I mean, it is, it's, it's without precedent because it is without precedent. Yeah, I think, I think that would, I'm trying to rack my brain to see if I can think of something else historically. But yeah, this is kind of a brand new animal that we're dealing with. Can I, can I ask? Yeah. Okay, so a, a follow-up to Kim's. For something that's a game-changer kind of law like this, you noted that one argument that could stop it would be that it causes harm. And with, without an idea that something causes harm, we're good. Is there also an obligation to show a good? Or is, is law merely concerned with making sure that whatever the government endorses or promotes, is it is it enough to say, and, and this is a broader question than just the topic of same-sex marriage, is, is, the, is the mere principle a lack of harm or does someone have to make a case for a good? Um, does that question make sense? Yeah, um, I, it kind of depends on how the issue comes into play. If, if, it's, if the first thing that happens is a state saying no gay people can get married, um, then you know you could have a same-sex couple coming forward and arguing that that's discriminatory without right. any legitimate government purpose. If it comes the other way around, where a state says same-sex marriages are allowable, then it would get into what you described. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, well, we are going to go next door to Blue Attractor, and again, we really tried to design tonight to just give you some different ways of thinking about this issue without actually getting into the issue of whether it's moral or moral because that's very subjective and personal. Um, and I think our presenters both did a very good job of doing that, but I also know that they are opinionated people and they'd probably be happy to talk about their opinions more candidly next door with some beers in them. Um, so I want to thank you guys all for coming out and please join me in giving a round of applause to our presenters.